Welcome to the Tree of Life podcast. My name is Joel Edford, and I'm happy to be here today with Professor Patrick Keeling. Patrick Keeling comes to us from the University of British Columbia. Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So um, today I'd like to start out by just getting to know you a little bit better, um, trying to figure out what your academic journey has been. A lot of our viewers like to learn how people made their way and oftentimes identify with certain parts of your story mm -hmm. and uh, the trials and tribulations, the successes and challenges. So can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up where you are? Sure, and and I agree. It's uh, Sometimes people are surprised the, how hard it is to get where you're going and how much randomness there is to it. So um, I always love hearing these stories. In my case, I grew up in a small town, in a farm outside a small town in Ontario and I was a terrible, terrible, terrible student who struggled uh, continuously through school. Um, really late in high school, discovered science and that I was actually good at it. And it was so fantastic to finally discover something that I was good at. And I went on and did an undergrad at uh, Western University in London, Ontario, and discovered endosymbiosis there. And I, I think, I, in retrospect, I realize I'm a contrarian because it was the endosymbiotic hypothesis for organelle origins was taught to me as being wrong and mm -hmm. it got me so interested in it and, I, and then I went back in time and thought well wait a minute the first time I ever picked up a textbook as a student was in uh, senior biology when I was actually taught creationism and not evolution and I went and looked at the sections on evolution in my textbook because I thought what are they trying to keep from me so, <laughs> right. you know as a teenage boy so I was looking for you know I was trying to be a rebel so I became an evolutionary biologist through this weird route by trying to rebel I think against what they're trying to teach me was true and I just seemed wrong so I kind of came at it from that direction and then I got into um, microbiology I, I, I work on genomes and evolution of microbial diversity uh, by mistake, because I was infatuated with one of my classes that they could understand how a ribosome worked at such a great level of detail. And I thought, ribosomes are very small. That must be microbiology. <laughs> oh, right. And so I signed up for a bunch of classes in microbiology, and, and it took me a few months, because I, I was a slow student, to realize that it was a different field entirely. But, um, you know, you make the best of it, and I kind of got interested in that, and, I, and then I got really interested in it, and I worked in a lab in microbiology. And, and then it all came together at the end of my undergraduate when one of my advisors in the job I was working on recognized that I was obsessed with DNA, but also microbes. And so he sent me to Fort Doolittle in Nova Scotia, and he said, go work for him, he's great. And so I did my PhD there, and, and then, uh, yeah, just carried on. Wow, so do you remember, um, like, f of course, for, for me, when I was, you know, looking through a microscope for the first time at a, a microbial eukaryote, that to me was like the, the, the linchpin, and I thought, wow, mm -hmm. I really, these, these, these things are so cool, there's so much, you know, diversity in their shapes and sizes and what they do and how they move. Do you remember looking at them for the first time under a microscope? Yeah, and I, I envy that because I never really had that experience my, in my undergraduate education. The, uh, that, that part of it came late for me because the lab I worked in worked on bacteria. And so my first love was actually getting to use an electron microscope. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a feeling of, I, I remember it was, I felt privileged because I had this fantastic instrument and I was just an undergrad and these people were trusting me to use this thing and take pictures of this really cool bacteria called Bedella Vibrio and so you know I felt like I had kind of got to the palace I was in I was I was working with royalty and it, it was that privileged feeling of being involved in that that really got me fired up and I didn't get involved in eukaryotes until after a year of my PhD and Miklos Müller who's a scientist at the Rockefeller University was a frequent visitor to the lab and he was always talking about the different kinds of protists he worked on and they were really fascinating and honestly I, I started up side projects on protists and my main project was on archaea and then um, it was one of those moments when the the whole project fell apart with a single southern blot and I remember it coming out of the out of the developer and I knew what the two possibilities were because I actually was you know testing a hypothesis for once and uh, 
it was the wrong answer. <laughs> oh, no. And I just, I remember I threw it in the garbage and walked out of the building and didn't come back for like three days. And then I started working on Protus because those projects were working and there was a lot to be done. And then my love of this just grew and grew and grew. And so uh, I still love the Archaea. I have, a, I have a really soft spot for the Archaea too. But ever since then, we've basically just uh, been playing around in this huge field with very few people in our way. So it's a great field to work in. So I, I had kind of a different way to approach this, but not through microscopy, interestingly. Got it. So, um, wow. So, so then tell me about after um, your PhD, after working with Ford Doolittle, what mm -hmm. was the trajectory then? Did, 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 were there any big changes? Absolutely. I had, um, so my PhD mostly focused on anaerobic parasites, and we were interested in the origin of the mitochondria and the evolution of the mitochondria. And at the time, and I think this is pretty common, I, I began to believe that this was the most interesting thing in the universe and everybody must be really interested in this because, you know, what else could be this interesting? And then I met Jeff McFadden, who's an Australian researcher. He's very, very well known in the field of symbiosis for his discoveries in plastid evolution. And I thought plastids were really boring because, yeah, I don't know, algae, I, I, just didn't, I just didn't see it. But I really liked Jeff, and he did amazing work, and so I had an opportunity to go do a postdoc with him, and I took it and started working on plastids, and, of course, very quickly realized these are not boring. There's all sorts of, you know, it was ignorance. I didn't, I didn't know the right questions, and once I got there and was working with him, I, it just opened up a whole new world. I give people this advice now, too, that that's a great time. You don't want to completely change unless you really hate what you're doing. But if you like your field, change a little bit, and it just opens up more avenues. And so that's what happened to me. So I came out of that kind of like, now I work on plastids. I still work on mitochondria. I still work on other kinds of symbionts. But it was, it was, a, it was kind of perfect for me as it happened. I got lucky. Hmm. <laughs> that's really awesome. And now at, at UBC, so... Can you tell me a little bit about what your lab's doing? What's, uh, what's, what's, I mean, you have a beautiful lab website, as I mentioned to you right, earlier thanks. before. Um, can you tell me what the, what the, what is the trajectory <laughs> in your lab right now? Okay. Well, tra trajectory is not the right word. It's more like a r how many ricochets, because <laughs> it, it, basically every single person in the lab is working on maybe a different kingdom. And so there's not a lot of structure in the sense that we have overarching long-range projects. We have a couple of those. Uh, we do some work with coral that's ongoing year after year. But a lot of it is, um, you know, I, th I think the best way to do it, to, you know, if you have a new student or a postdoc that's coming in is you, you kind of get a high-level idea of what they're interested in doing. And you pitch a couple projects back and forth with each other until you land on something that makes sense to start with. And then you, you kind of both cross your fingers and hope that they develop it from there. And so mm -hmm. people go off in their own directions. Uh, you know, so I've worked on just about every kind of protist imaginable. Not all of them, but, you know, most of them. Um, but I've assiduously avoided two of the best studied groups of protists up until recently. And then I had people that really wanted to work on those, and they dragged me kicking and screaming into those groups too, and I just let that happen. And so. what are those two groups? Well, ciliates, ciliates are among the most fascinating protists. I'll be the first to admit it, but I've never actually worked on them because lots of people work on ciliates, and I just kind of like the underdogs, so I've worked on other stuff. But I had a postdoc join my lab of many years ago now, and he had some really great uh, experimental system to do ciliate symbiosis evolution, and now we work on ciliates. And okay. so that's great. It's, it, it's kind of how things work. I have another student that's got me working more on stromenopiles, which is another group I had uh, kind of avoided because there's lots of people working on diatoms. But it's fun. I learn a lot. There's still lots to learn. Well, in um, intro biology, as I mentioned, I mean, one thing that will probably make you warm and fuzzy is we do expose students to lots of these different groups, including ciliates and stromatopiles and Good. all kinds of stuff in the termite hindgut. Um, oh. it's, it, and yeah. and they're, it's beautiful and really captivating, and it's great to see students get excited about them. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned, one of the topics that students oftentimes struggle with mm -hmm. um, is endosymbiosis. I think that they're really interested in it, but sometimes th distinguishing primary, secondary, and tertiary can be a little challenging for them. And so what I thought I would do mm. is take a moment, show you how I've developed a way of teaching it, 
and maybe you can find areas that need a little bit of enrichment. Oh, no. um, uh, maybe find areas where there are, are clear misconceptions because obviously that, you know, I don't have everything right. Uh, and maybe we can like, you know, uh, bedazzle the uh, idea and and my approach to teaching endosymbiosis and uh, you can help out. Maybe I'm going to be the one that learned something here. So Well, I'm Let's excited. So. I'm excited. And I let, I'm going to get some paper. I'm going to show you what I do. All right. Okay, so let's have a look, um, and I'll show you what I do. And you know, again, like I said, maybe you can make adjustments as I go. Um, so I always, I always start with primary, of course. And, and, and this is always a little bit tricky for me because I always, um, probably much to um, your, you know, consternation here, as I'm going to draw a blob, which mm, is that's not okay in this context. Okay, okay, thank you for that. <laughs> I actually start out by going, well, let's assume that there's a nucleus here, and I'm going to call this the last eukaryotic common ancestor. Okay. Malika had a nucleus, so you could just draw a nucleus, I think. Okay, so this is this is where I start. Okay. Okay, and then I say, all right, uh, then we have Leka with its nucleus, Engulfing and uh, look, there's two membranes. There. Nice, Just, you know, nice. That That's okay. great. Um, some lineage related, probably to something like alpha proteobacteria. Okay. And over time, leaving all kinds of details out. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, now. Yep. Um, we get the mitochondrion. Sometimes we talk about. Membranes. I always talk about membranes. Okay, so that would be a, a good thing to talk about. And I and color code them. Okay, well, I'd like to see that. And But the other thing that I do emphasize that I do think is important is I tend to focus on the number of genomes and make sure that students know, look, look there's two different genomes here. Got it. And so I'm curious to know, so what kinds of adjustments okay. uh, would you would you? Well, so make? far, like mm -hmm. this, I don't have any problems with this at all. Having two membranes on the bacteria is an important thing for students to learn because that's almost universally shown wrongly in illustrations that they can find on the web. They usually show a bacteria with one membrane and a lot of these diagrams of endosymbiosis will show a single membrane bound bacteria being swallowed and the two membranes of the organelle coming from the phagosome and the one membrane. And that's okay. Probably wrong. Okay. The two membranes probably come from the two membranes of the bacterium. Okay. And so the phagosome is probably the one that was lost. Lost. Okay. But there would have been three. And so I use the, I used, my class is too big now, but I used to get the students to draw this themselves on the board in groups and then get, and I'd let them get stumped on the third membrane and go, well, wait a minute, where's that gone? Right? Right. Because they know there should be two, but then when you draw the process, you get three. So I kind of use that to drive home to them where they come from. So one other thing I'd do is I'd move the word Lika. Okay. Because Lika had a nucleus and also had a mitochondrion. Ah, okay. Right? Because so we the, need to change. The last common yeah. ancestor already had the mitochondrion. Okay. And so Lika's down there at the end of this. This okay. is some pre Lika. So you would call this this and result Lika. Yeah. Well, Lika okay. was a fully formed eukaryotic, eukaryotic cell. cell. Lika okay. was, that's part of our problem, is that Lika wasn't missing much. All and right. so it's hard for us to reconstruct the order of events because so much had already happened when extant eukaryotes diverged from each other. Okay. So Lika is a full on eukaryote. If you saw Lika today, you go, oh, there's a protist. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this, so far, so, so far, so good. Yeah. Okay. But if you color code the bacterial membranes, then you can keep track of them. And then when you end up with the two membranes on the mitochondria, you can color them blue. Uh, and the okay. students will realize there, I actually often draw an intermediate stage where you have, where you have like a back, you have the, the I always draw the nucleus like this too. Um, so you can keep this intermediate phase for a second and just say, that's what you should get when you phagocytose a bacteria. Okay. So either it wasn't phagocytosis, which a lot of people say, in their sort of chimeric origin of eukaryotes kind of models. Or if it was phagocytosis, then this membrane would have to be lost. Okay. Right? Okay, that makes sense. Those are pretty small details. Okay, but those, that's good. All right, so uh, secondary. Or no, no, yeah. 
No, we're not done with primary. Well, we gotta get plastics in. We gotta yeah. plastic, yeah, sorry. Yeah. But that's easy, because it's the same. It's the same, right, okay. But this time, um, one question. You're not dotting in the nucleus because you don't know it's there. You're dotting it in because it has pores, right? I'm dotting it in because it has pores. Okay. Is that Something I always right? emphasize to the students, because it's a nice counterpoint to the mm -hmm. mitochondrion, is that the, mito or the, the, the nucleus is often said to be a double membrane-bound organelle, and it's not. It's actually a single membrane that's folded back on itself. Okay. So if you look at the membrane in the pore, it actually goes right around in a tight corner and goes back. Okay. It's just a fun, like then you can it's a great question how can you contrast the two membranes around the mitochondrion from the nucleus and they can understand that the topology is different the origins of the membranes is different so i draw these like two little two okay i see that's bent why sausages yeah that's a good idea yeah. actually I, uh, this is it a is thing i do but i don't know if it helps okay so i have my nucleus mm -hmm. um i have my mitochondrion mm -hmm. and I am engulfing, but not digesting something related yep. to cyanobacteria. And we even know what kind of cyanobacteria now, because recently there was a very interesting paper with this thing called gliomargarita. It oh. turns out to be particularly related to, to cyanobacteria. Gliomargarita. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's actually... It's a it's a big big advance really to figure that out. I wish they'd figure that out for the mitochondrion. Gleo margarita. Okay. Uh -huh. And Sorry, uh, I can't help but spew. No, that. it's just it's <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, and so we sort of end up with our plastid, which I'm calling chloroplast. Yep. But yep. Um, here we are, and again, once again, I am emphasizing mm -hmm. three. Yep. Genomes. But so would, would you color code this Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. Okay. I would. So you would still do the Because I have coding. little green ones for the. Ah, because of course. then you can go okay. through the same thing. And, and sometimes I actually just do this once and basically just say the plastid was kind of the same. Okay. But then you end up, you can keep those colors because when you get into secondary symbiosis, the colors are really handy because uh -huh. then you've got another organism eating this thing and you keep the colors from the first one. Like if, if this is a. a a red cell, yeah, I have it be eaten by a blue cell. Right. And then you have the red and the blue membranes. You can maintain that through the whole process. Okay, I'm gonna use the color coding from now on. You've convinced me. All right, so I'm gonna put that aside if we're okay with that. Yeah. Anything you would add? You just have to get really good at holding a lot of pens. You do. Yeah, it's, it's like true. it's like smoking three cigarettes at <laughs> once. You just it's <laughs> it's actually tricky. It's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna put that aside since we're mostly okay with that. And then I'll go on to secondary endosymbiosis, which Maybe there will be more problems. So secondary. So now I'm thinking, okay, well, I have a eukaryote with the nucleus and a mitochondrion that's going to gain the ability to do photosynthesis. Yep. And this is going to happen because this eukaryote, I just drew a little bit bigger so I can fit it. Mm-hmm is going to engulf but not digest. We're gonna run out Basically of room. Basically the, the, the outcome of yep. our primary endosymbiosis where we have- This is where the colors come in handy. This is where the colors is, are definitely gonna come in handy. And I will shamefully admit to you that I don't pay so much attention to the membranes at this point oh. because I'm Again, the membranes are everything. The membranes are everything. Yeah. And you've convinced me of that too. And I'm a genomics guy, and the membranes right. are everything. And so I am ending up with this too mm -hmm. many cooks in the kitchen kind of scenario. Yep. Oops. In which case. You got some more membranes to draw there. I know I do. Let me be the membrane police. I know you should. You should definitely not let. Don't let me get away <laughs> with anything. And in which case, uh, most of the time, we end up. You're missing a membrane. Losing. Oh. Where's the phagosome? I have to do that. Yeah. Right. You need the colors. The colors. This, yeah. this is true. Then you remember. It actually helps you teach it's it. It's going to help me teach it. You keep track of things by the colors because it is complicated. It is. Okay. So then I end up. In most cases, losing yeah. that. 
in most cases losing that, although I know that there are exceptions. Yeah, in every case the, of secondary symbiosis, the mitochondrion's gone. Mitochondrion's so you can just, gone. That's universally okay. gone universally. in secondary symbiosis. But the nucleomorph in some yeah, things in, remain. And at this point, I start listing the things that have this stage. But this is confusing because they think that it's a progression. Mm. And I think there's a better way to do it, but I'm not, uh, I'm not sure how. Okay. Because at this point, I might say there are things like this, and they are chlorarachnophytes and cryptomonads. Ah, right. I'm not okay. convinced that's a great idea. It might confuse people. It might be too much. Yeah. Well, either way, mm -hmm. I end up with, oops, with my cell mm -hmm. that now has a chloroplast, mm -hmm. but all kinds of membranes around it. Only four. Only four. And but they're all different colors, so they're easy to keep track of. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to use the colors from now on. You've absolutely <laughs> convinced me. But, you know, this ends up uh -huh. being one of these things where I don't know if this is true or not, but I often tell my students, well, this is one of the ways that secondary endosymbiosis is really discovered is because you end up with this chloroplast that mm -hmm. has sort of too many membranes around that. Is that a fair statement? Actually, that was so... Um, that's that's so subtle that I don't think that actually led people to figure out what was going on. But what did was the nucleomorph. The relic nucleus in this stage okay. in the chlorarachnophytes and the cryptomonads was uh, you know, was in your face. So the the electron microscopists were looking at this and going, That looks like a nucleus. So that was actually a big clue. And this is where my supervisor in Australia, that's what he was primarily, like originally he was really well known for discovering what the nucleomorph was and identifying that it contained uh, eukaryotic genes that looked like green algal nuclear genes. Okay. And everybody was like, kazam, like a light goes off. That's a eukaryote, right? Right. And so the extra membranes were just like confusing. And so, okay. like, you glean it. People talked about it all the time because they're like, this thing looks like a trypanosome, but then it's got these pigments that make it look like a green algae. What's going on? And it's because it is a mixture of both. Okay. But the extra membranes are, in the case of euglena, the extra one membrane, because th there's another stage where some things have lost one lost of these membranes. Yeah, right. um, the numbers of membranes was confusing. And, okay. and I, I'll tell you, too, this is way better than what I got. Because when I was a student, they literally listed a bunch of algae, and then they just ticked boxes off of characteristics. So this one has three membranes. This one has four. But there is no context. And so I love what you're doing here because you're showing them how it evolved, and that gives them the context to understand the complexity, right? Okay. So I think that's great. Good. Yes. This is my initial sketch of secondary endosymbiosis. So what kinds of things w do you think it needs? Okay, I, th I think it captures the essential parts of the process and it does so very nicely. And I, I, as I keep joking, color coding is really helpful. And I actually teach this too. And one of the reasons I use color coding is because, well, two reasons. The first is the membranes are everything. If you understand, I tell the students, if you understand where all the membranes and all the compartments came from, then you understand the process and you can reconstruct the process from the outcome or the outcome from the process because it all actually makes sense. So don't worry because there's no mysteries. All the membranes are where they should be. All the compartments are where they should be. And if you get that, it all makes sense, even though it's complicated. The other thing I do is I go on and then teach them about protein targeting. Okay. And there's added steps when you add secondary symbiosis. And it's like, doors with keys is how Jeff McFadden put it. And you have to have the right keys in the right order to get through the doors. But again, the beauty of it is it all makes sense. It's actually totally logical and totally sensible. So I add two things to this. The first is at the very end, I draw a cell a lot like your last cell, but a little bit bigger. And I go through with the students and I label every membrane and every compartment between every membrane and ask them, where did it come from? And so they have to look at the thing and say, well, the first membrane is part of the endomembrane of the secondary host. And then they know how a protein would target across it, secretory system. Mm. Then what's the next compartment? It's the lumen of the endomembrane system. The next one is the, is the plasma membrane of the secondary algal symbiont. The next one is that cytosol. So then you go, where's the nucleomorph? Well, it has to be in the cytosol. Right. It all makes sense. And they go through all the membranes and all the compartments and label them all. And then, you know, it just reinforces the same thing because you're learning the same thing from three different directions at this point. 
then the last thing I do is complicated, which is I go through sort of a branching tree of following the symbionts so they understand, you know, why cryptomonads have a red algal one. So I go through the whole process again, but where it branches. So you've got two secondary green ones. Here they are eating two different algae and making chlorarachnophytes and euglenids. That's a bit of an undertaking, and it might right. be too much for first year. But it helps, again, because it reinforces exactly the same story. So what I love about this is it's complicated, but it actually makes sense. Yeah, no, I that that when you when you mentioned color coding the membranes, I used to, you know, students oftentimes got confused about the membranes and where they were coming coming mm-hmm. from, and so I tried to simplify it. Maybe you know, at this point, I'm realizing too much by focusing on the number of um, genomes. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It makes great sense to color code them and ask them, you know, where they all came from. Now. I gotta tell you, like tertiary for me, I am like tertiary is fun. Okay, so I'm not <laughs> really great at tertiary because here's where I start to fudge things. Because usually by this point they're like, okay, I'm a little confused. But tertiary, I say, well, you're gonna <laughs> hate this. I um, they, and they do. And, and I'm like, okay, so basically we ended up with like this Pac-Man from hell sort of situation <laughs> where. We have this happening kind of again. Um, but, but it already has a plastic. But it already. Because it's a dino. Right. And so then you end up with this crazy plastic with lots and lots and lots of lots membranes. Lots of membranes. Yeah. Um, we don't I, even know in some of them. It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's arguable how many membranes they have because they're so close together, they're hard to count. And so, it, it, and this is one of the reasons why. I sort of skirted away from the membranes was because it's good right up till there though. Okay, it's yeah. good up to there. Tertiary starts to break down. The sense, the common sense part starts to drift away there somewhere. Right. Well, they, I I guess what it, for me is that the students start to you know lose count and then they're focusing on trying to count the membranes as mm-hmm. opposed to thinking more about the genomes and yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, the genomes is where the tertiary gets fun. Okay. So the membranes, I keep the color coding because it all makes sense and it helps them understand the process. But then with tertiary symbiosis, how I deal with it is I literally go through all this and then I write the word tertiary on the board. And they all, on a good day, they, well, most sometimes they don't do anything, but on a good day, they groan. Yeah, you hear a groan. It's yeah, good. exactly. And so then I don't really go into it too much. I just say it happens. It's always a dinoflagellate eating something and mm-hmm. they've eaten these things. And then I kind of leave it there. And I say it's complicated and every outcome is a little bit different. So, you know, don't worry about it. Just know what happens. But then on the exam, you can give them hypotheticals and make them think about what it would be like Mm -hmm. if you had taught it. And it's actually quite fun. So then you can say, uh, imagine a tertiary symbiosis and it's a dinoflagellate, it's a haptophyte. And let's say it keeps five genomes. Draw that thing for me and pick any five you want Uh. and justify them and then show me where they go on the tree. Because mm-hmm. that helps students remember, no matter how many times that plastid's been swallowed, it's still a cyanobacterium. And mm-hmm. that's something that students actually really struggle with, I find, is that they have to remember that it didn't change its evolutionary history. It just changes its context in the cell. And that's a really important distinction that I think we take for granted when we work on these things. But to them, it's not so obvious. And I understand why. Yeah, well, you know, like as a follow-up to that, oftentimes... When, when we come to the end and students understand, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary, one of the questions is, well, did this just stop? Is it happening again? Are there, can we expect some new organelles to appear? What, mm-hmm. you no, know, what's, yeah. what's, what's next? And then you throw out pollinella. I don't know pollinella. Pollinella oh. is a rhizo. It's a rhizarian. It's a okay. testate amoeba. It's called a euglyphid. So it's a beautiful amoeba with this shell of the these really beautiful regular. They look like tiles. They're like scales. And the amoeba lives inside it, and it sends out little pseudopodia, and it eats stuff. So these are heterotrophs. But pollinella has picked up a different cyanobacteria fairly recently and incorporated it into its cell and now has protein targeting. There's genes encoded in the nucleus that are targeted to this thing. It's inherited, uh, you know, vertically. And it's basically a new plastid that's from a cynicocystis and that's not related to these plastids. And so the answer to that student's question is, yes, absolutely, it's still happening. Outstanding. Yeah. 
Well, uh, this has been really helpful for me. Um, I really appreciate all of your care and attention to improving the way I'm going to teach this from uh, from now on. And um, I definitely appreciated hearing about your academic journey. It was a pleasure meeting you. Um, Thank you. I look forward to hearing about your future research. And thanks for coming and uh, being on the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.